there are 43 places around the Great Lakes that need special cleanup and restoration, five of them in Wisconsin. These have been named areas of concern by the federal government. To monitor and keep track of the progress of the cleanup, they've enlisted the help of the scientific community. To do that, scientists need something to test and act as a benchmark to study the results. They've chosen the tree swallow to act as this benchmark or indicator species. There's a lot of different kind of indicator species out there, but we've chosen the tree swallow uh, for a variety of uh, important reasons. One reason is that tree swallows nest in holes, so they can be drawn to an area by providing nest boxes. The birds are just almost magically drawn to these nest boxes. And we can put these nest boxes up at whatever areas we wish to have data collected. And we probably have close to a thousand nest boxes out. So that's a lot of bird monitoring that we're doing over the course of the summer. And tree swallows eat the right thing. Insects that live on the lake and river bottom as larvae and emerge as flying insects when they are adults. Once the tree swallows consume these insects, then the female who lays the egg will have incorporated those contaminants in her body tissues, specifically in the lipid tissues. And then that lipid and energy then is transferred into the egg. So we collect two random eggs from a clutch. And based on what's in those eggs, then we know what the female's been exposed to. Nestlings can also be exposed to contaminants when they are fed by the parent birds. And if contamination is high enough, and, and that's one of the reasons that we're doing this study, is to determine if contaminants are high enough, then there could be adverse effects. Some contaminants may be present in the water or sediment, but are not transferred easily to birds or other wildlife. There's a lot of complex chemistry, geochemistry, that goes on, and so just because they're in the water doesn't mean they're going to be in the birds. And that's especially true of some of the trace elements, mercury, cadmium, selenium, because they're naturally in rocks. And just because they're there doesn't mean they're going to translate up the food chain. Other contaminants in the environment may be at low levels, but transfer easily to tissues and are passed from one animal to another through the food chain. As you move from the benthic invertebrates, up to, say, the fish, up to the birds, and at each of those levels, it's at a higher concentration in the, the next level as it was at the previous level. Understanding how contaminants accumulate in the food chain and what effects those contaminants have helps us better protect the health of fish and wildlife that live in and near an area of concern. We can put less of our resources trying to clean up after a contaminant that is that is locked up and stable versus a contaminant such as uh, PCBs that are moving through the ecosystem and becoming problematic in critters that we care about. By sampling the same species, our indicator species, across all areas of concern, scientists can make direct comparison between these contaminated sites. For EPA and the state DNRs and DEQs to make decisions, they need to know how their site or their location rank out compared to everywhere else in the U.S. So that does help in the cleanup and assessing the restoration at, at these AOCs across the entire five Great Lakes.